Okay, so we are ready to um, for the last tutorial on, uh, on numerical linear algebra, and this is a high-performance library for uh, iterative schemes, uh, preconditioning techniques. And Zanio is uh, has participated in the ACTS workshop uh, previously, and he's a member of the Hyper development team, and he's at Lawrence Livermore. And so, welcome, Sanyo. Thanks, Connor. Right. I'd like to give you an overview of Hyper, which is uh, the name of our library of high performance preconditioners. Uh, it's a software uh, that we developed at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and more specifically at the Center for Applied Scientific Computing there. Okay. Can you hear me well? All right. Um, Hyper has a very long history, um, and this is our current development team. Um, Rob Fulgo is our project leader. Uh, you can kind of get an idea how many man hours have gone into it by just the list of the former people on the team. And this is our website. I'm going to refer to it uh, several times. This is where you can download the code and get documentation um, or information how to submit bugs or requests. Okay, this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. First, a little bit of introduction, why you need Hyper, uh, and then how you want to use it. What, what do you need to do if you want to use it? Uh, we have a variety of um, different interfaces that are used not only um, to allow us to solve a linear system better, but also uh, to describe it uh, in different ways that are more convenient for you. Um, so I'm going to go through the four of the interfaces that we have in Hyper, and then I'm going to talk about how we solve, actually, uh, the system that is described for these interfaces. Uh, we have a variety of solvers and preconditioners available there, and then finish with some additional information um, that's related to websites and stuff like that, building. Okay, so the first thing is that um, most of the solvers in Hyper are based on multigrid. Um, and you want to use Hyper when you try to solve a really large problem on a parallel machine. Um, when you do that, it's important that you um, use an algorithm that is optimal. And multigrid is, is a class of uh, linear solvers that are optimal in the sense that if you have a system with n unknowns, multigrid requires order n operation to solve it. Okay? Uh, that becomes important when you care about scaling. And the classical example of scaling that we care about is weak scaling, where you use, we try to solve larger and larger problems by using more and more processors by keeping the size of the problem per processor the same. Okay? So use more processors to solve larger problems. If you do weak scaling uh, and uh, if you have an optimal algorithm, what this means is that you're going to be able to solve larger and larger problems in the same amount of time. So if you plot the number of processors versus the time to solution, a scalable algorithm will look like that. So it will take you the same one minute to solve a problem with 100 unknowns on 10 processors as with, I don't know, 10,000 unknowns on 1,000 uh, processors. And this is in contrast to most of the simple uh, uh, linear solvers like, say, diagonal scale CG, conjugate gradient. Uh, where, which need more and more time when you try to solve larger and larger problems. Okay? Uh, now, if you're not familiar with multigrid, uh, here's a one-slide overview of it. Uh, basically, as you may have guessed for the name, multigrid uses uh, several different grids, and it's using them to efficiently reduce the components of the error at different scales that correspond to these different grids. So, for example, if your error in the linear system that you're solving looks like this, so you can uh, see that this is basically a, a low frequency noise plus high frequency noise. What multigrid does is first, it's using a, it, it uses a simple um, smoothing or relaxation procedure like Jacobi or gauss Idel to get rid of the high frequency error. So you go from here to here, you're just left with the low frequency component of the error. Now, since this is smooth, it can be represented pretty accurately on a coarser grid. And that's done for a process that's called restriction. So we go through this fine, from this fine grid to this coarse grid. 
And because of the smoothness, this representation is relatively exact. You do smoothing on this grid, and then you continue recursively until you get to a very coarse grid where you can solve the problem exactly. Okay? Then you use what we call the prolongation or the multigrid interpolation uh, to bring this uh, error correction that you've computed on the coarse grid all the way back to the fine grid. And this is called the multigrid V cycle, and it's um, basically one iteration of the multigrid algorithm. The essential components that you need to define in order to have a successful multigrid algorithm is smoothing. In hyper, usually that's something simple, like point smoother, like Jacobi or gauss Adel, as I said. And your prolongation and restriction. Uh, in most algorithms in hyper, the restriction is the dual of the transpose of the prolongation. So really, the important thing is how you define the prolongation. And that means how you define what your coarse grid, op what your coarse grid um, uh, looks like and how you, if you have some data on the coarse grid, how you bring it to the fine grid. Okay. So uh, this was the motivation behind the type of solvers that we have in Hyper. Now, what do you need to do if you want to use it? The first thing you need to identify is uh, what is the correct uh, conceptual interface that describes your problem. Okay? Once you've identified that, uh, you need to pick between the available solvers and preconditioners for that interface. And optionally, choose the matrix type that is compatible with the solver and the interface. Okay? Now, once you, once you made these choices, you have to build some auxiliary structures. For example, in the struct interface, we have grid stencils. Then build the matrix and the vector. Define a solver and preconditioner. And then call uh, the solve routines to solve your system. And after that, extract the information that you care about, like values at the grid points, um, and so forth. Okay, this is just uh, uh, some representation of the interfaces that are available. Struct, adaptive mesh refinement, semi-struct, unstructured matrix interface, which we call IJ. Some of the solvers that are available, and the connections to the interfaces. So for example, AMG is available in all interfaces. And some of the data layouts that are, go from structured to block structured to completely unstructured in this compressed parse row matrix format uh, that also relate to the solvers. Okay, why do we need multiple interfaces? This is uh, maybe, um, may seem a little strange. Why do we need, uh, why can we just ask you for the matrix? The reason, there are two reasons for it. First of all, it's to make your life easier. It allows you to describe the problem in the most natural way to your application. And Hyper takes care of the translation from maybe your stencil perspective to matrix perspective that we need ultimately to solve the system. The second, maybe not so obvious reason is different interfaces enable us to define different solvers. If you have a structured problem and we don't know about your grid, we cannot define structured multigrid where this prolongation operator, the interpolation that I was talking about, is defined in a purely geometric way, or at least somewhat geometric way. So, um, so the, the more concrete representation, the closer your representation uh, of the problem uh, uh, that you can give us in, uh, through our conceptual interfaces, the better it is in terms of the solvers that we can uh, make available to you. And also, of course, if we have structured data, we can store it more efficiently. So that's also important. All right. The interfaces that we currently have, the structured grid interfaces, the structured grid interface, which is good for logically rectangular grids, semi-structured grid interface, that is good for grids that are mostly structured, uh, but not completely. They have several parts that are structured. Finite element interfaces for finite element problems. And the more general interface we have is the linear algebraic of the IJ interface, uh, which is just uh, describing the matrix. And now I'm going to go into some details about how you describe your problem through each of these interfaces. Okay, so the struct interface. Again, uh, it's appropriate for problems that have only one scalar known uh, and uh, are defined on um, structured grid. Structured grid here means that the grid is topologically structured. It doesn't have to have straight lines. 
needs to be in the same index space. So basically, you have a number of boxes which are indexed with um, uh, you know, a couple of numbers in 2D or a triple of numbers in 3D uh, from the lower left to the upper right corner. You can have different boxes. They don't need to align. Again, these guys don't need to be straight, but they need to be topologically uh, rectangular and the unknowns of the problem are at the center of these boxes. That's what's assumed. In order to use this interface, you need to de describe your grid, provide your discretization stencil, then set up the struct matrix and the right-hand side vector. And I'm gonna show you how to do that for simple Poisson problem. Let's say this is the mesh you wanna, this is the grid you wanna solve a problem on. And we're gonna use a standard five-point stencil. Let's say it's split in two processors this way. And we're going from index space uh, from uh, the boxes, the, lo the lower left corner is with coordinate minus three one, and then the upper right corner will be with coordinate six four. So first x, then y uh, coordinate here. And this is what you need to do, for example, on process zero in order to use the struct interface. The first thing is you need to create the grid. That's simple code to struct grid create. You provide a communicator, how many dimensions. It's a two-dimensional problem, so n is two. And then you're returned a grid object. Okay. Now you need to specify the extents of the grid. So basically describe the boxes that define the grid. In this case, we, we can do that with two boxes in different ways, but let's say we describe this box first and this box second. To describe the boxes, you provide lower left and upper right coordinates. So to describe this box, we go from minus three, one to minus one, two. Okay. So you just pass this to the set, uh, grid set extends call. Then you describe the second box. Again, for the same grid, you just pass the lower left and the upper right. You can do this as many times as you want, and Hyper will automatically know how to merge the grid and describe this whole index space. And when you're done, you just set grid assemble. Okay? This uh, gives us enough information now to know what are your unknowns and where they are on this logical grid. Now, to describe your discretization, if it's most natural to you, um, you can use stencils, okay? The five-point stencil is just this. If each, each degree of freedom is related to itself and its four neighbors, four logical neighbors. And to define a stencil like that, you just say, um, I have a two-dimensional stencil of size five and please return this object in, um, this, in, in this variable stencil. Now, to describe what the, actual, um, what the actual stencil is, you need to give its, stencil, its entries in terms of logical offsets compared to its center. So logical offset means that the connection to itself is described as 0, 0, offset 0, 0. That's what is done here. You said entry 0, the first entry, has offset 0, 0. So that's the connection to, 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 to myself. Connection to left, its logical offset is minus 1, 0. That's entry one, that's the offset. You just, the same call. And connection to the right, the offset is one, zero. The bottom zero, minus one, to the top zero, one. Is yes? There, the, how you this order? There, is no, there is no restriction on how you define the order. The only restriction is that you can uh, only describe connections to nearest neighbors. So in 2D, you cannot go be beyond nine points there. So, yeah, so I can describe what the order. You can, you can Describe it any way you want. That's just an example. All right? Um, and that's it. There is no assembly. You just specify the stencil. OK. We have the grid. We have the stencil. The only thing we don't have is what, is, what are the actual values of the stencil at each point. OK. This is how you actually describe the matrix. And uh, we use the struct interface. So we, we'll use the struct matrix A. Um, it's, the matrix is created based on the grid and the stencil it's, and, and the communicator. It's initialized. Then the values are set here in these calls to set box values. Uh, and when all the values are set, you call struct matrix assemble to finish it. Now let's look at these calls. How do you set the values of the matrix? Or alternatively, how do you set the stencils? Well, you do it box by box. There's no restriction again. You can do it 
any amount, uh, any, you can use any boxes you want. Don't need to be the same boxes that you used to describe the grid, for example. So, uh, and you don't need to describe the whole stencil uh, in each, each of this course. You can describe a subset of the stencil. So this is an example where you just describe uh, these two components of the stencil, the connection to itself and the connection uh, to your south neighbor, okay? Uh, and it's done using the same boxes that we used before, but again, it, they don't have to be like that. So this, uh, the extent of this box, and these two guys were the extent of these two boxes. The call specifies the matrix, the box that you're setting the values on. How many entries are you setting? So how many stencil entries? In this case, I said, we're just gonna put these two, so n entries is two. Then what are the actual entries? If you remember, zero was the connection to itself, three was the connection to the bottom. And then all the values for all the stencil entries in all the um, in all of these all of the cells in this box. So we have, for example, here six cells in this first box, two stencil entries per cell. So we need twelve values, right? And they are all four minus one. But we have an array here of size twenty-four, which has four minus one, four minus one, four minus one. And the reason it's twenty-four and not twelve is because we also use the same. We just reuse in this case this array to specify the values in this larger box. In this larger box, we have 12 cells, two entries each, so we need 24 numbers. This clear? This is a simple problem where the stencil has constant coefficients. In principle, each cell may have different coefficients, and then the entries in this array, of course, will be different. Okay. I'm a little bit confused. Why, if you have the same stencil everywhere, why don't you just specify the simple one? You, you, you have an option to do that. This is. This is a very specific problem, constant coefficients, and it's, it's, it rarely happens. But we do have, we do have a mode where you ha can have just one stencil. This is the interface that you will probably use in practice when your stencil varies. It's just for simplicity, I didn't put <coughs> different numbers. All right. Um, let's see. Let's say you want to. Um, let's say you want to specify boundary conditions. Uh, and the way you specify them is by zeroing out the south connection uh, right here on, in this box uh, on the lower boundary. Right? As I said, you can call set box values with different boxes. So for example, you can just uh, use the same calls that we used on the previous slide to zero this component. The box that you're interested in here goes from minus three one to two one. So that's the extents that you're going to use here. The values are just zeros. You have six cells, so you have six zeros that you want to set. And you say, I'm going to set one entry. Uh, and the entry is connection free, the connection to your south neighbor. And the values are these six zeros. So this will zero uh, the six um, uh, stencils, stencil entries uh, for the cells on the bottom. Okay, this is for the matrix. The vector, to define a vector, it's simpler just because uh, it's defined on, based on the grid. There's no stencil, you initialize it, and then you have set box values where you just directly give numbers uh, for the different cells in a box. There's no stencil here, so you directly give the, what are the values in these uh, uh, six cells here and what are the values in these 12 cells here. And then you have a vector assembler at the end. Okay, um, so you do that on processor zero. You, you, you describe the corresponding part on processor one, and that's all. Hyper will assemble things for you. It, uh, um, it will take care of the parallel uh, exchange of information that needs to happen for the stencils that cross the processor boundaries. And you don't need to think about it um, in any other terms but grids and stencils. Okay. Um, for some solvers, we can support uh, symmetric storage. If your stencil is symmetric, so you just say matrix set, set symmetric here, uh, and you specify the lower, um, the, sorry, the upper right components of the stencil. So for example, for the five-point stencil, this three. Um, and then we take care of recovering the full stencil for you. Um, now this is, the, this is the struct. This is the struct interface. Do you have any questions about this? 
so far. When you say set up the boundary, is it talking about physical boundary or quick boundary? You can, it's, it's really up to you. This is just an example how, for example, people usually set the Dirichlet boundary conditions. No, I mean, uh, when you're talking about those uh, boundary settings, yes. so you have an example showing six cells, if it's quick boundary, then every, every cell will end up almost every cell that needs to set the boundary, right? So right. you're talking about, we're talking about the physical boundary. So when they put it really at the... I'm talking about setting the boundary conditions. Right. And your boundary conditions for your linear system can be, for example, Dirichlet boundary conditions on your physical right, so boundary. Physical domain boundary. Yes. Okay. So your domain here looks like that, right? Um, but they may be different. Okay. So um, now let me talk. Uh, let me switch to the semi-structured interface or struct, and that's a, that generalizes the struct interface in several important ways. First of all. You can have a number of structured patches, which we call parts, that are connected in a non-structured way. Second of all, you support adaptive mesh refinement. So you have a grid that's refined locally. Uh, you can also support overset grids. But in addition to this, you also support more general problems. In the struct interface, as I said, you only can solve um, scalar PDs that have a nonce at the center of the cells. In the abstract interface, you can have variables at the centers, at the nodes, uh, at the edges, at the faces. There can be multiple of them at the same location. So you can have vector problems, and they can be connected in a very complicated and almost arbitrary way. Now, the convention again is that when you, uh, that you uh, re refer to the variables associated with a cell um, using the upper right convention. So this is the zero, zero cell variable. This is the zero, zero uh, Y phase variable. This is the zero, zero um, X phase variable. And this is the zero, zero node variable. That's, uh, that's for this particular cell. All right, as I said, the grid is composed out of structured grids that are called parts. And we have a new object called a graph that allows us to connect the parts, but it also allows us to actually have almost arbitrary connections that are not governed uh, uh, by, um, by the relations between the parts. This is, for example, useful for when you do the adaptive mesh refinement. Okay. Um, furthermore, you can use not only stencils now, but you can use finite element stiffness matrices. If you have a finite element problem, that's a much more natural way to describe it. Um, so the graphs, yeah. right, you can use this graph add entries to add arbitrary connections. Uh, you can use grid set neighbor part and grid set shared part that I'm going to talk about in a little bit to describe the connections between the parts. And I'm going to show you how this works on a um, block structured example with stencils um, on, yeah more general grid with finite elements, and uh, just give a little bit of information about uh, structured AMR. Okay, compared to before, we have one new step here. We need to set up the graph. Okay, and here is an example that we're gonna use. You're gonna, uh, we have five parts, um, five different stencils in uh, cell-centered and uh, edge-centered variables, and um, we don't, we're not going to specify exactly what uh, these stencils are, but this is the, their connectivity. So these are, uh, you know, five-point stencil here and uh, nine-point stencil uh, here and here. Okay, let's focus on part, um, part three, so this guy here. And just, just remember that the numbering is uh, x goes here, y X grows this way, Y grows this way, X grows this way, Y grows this way, and so forth. Okay. So, what's the difference uh, with before? We again create the grid, uh, but this time, in addition, uh, we have one additional parameter, the number of the parts. But that's all. We specify the grid extents the same way as before. We only have to also specify which part are we talking about, in this case, part three. 
So there is only one box in this case from 1, 1 to 4, 4. OK. Now we have to say what kind of variables we have on this grid. Before, we only had one. So now we have to specify that we have a cell-centered variable, a x phase, and a y phase variable. The order doesn't matter. But you're going to use the 0, 1, and 2 um, um, identifiers that you've specified here later to refer to them. Okay? So the, call, uh, the, the function is just grid set variables. You specify the grid, the part. You have three type of variables, and what's, what are their types? These are hyper-specified constants to identify them. Right? OK. Now, since you have the structured parts, you need some way to describe how are they connected in space. They are not part, because the problem is unstructured, they're not part of the same logical um, index space. Right? That's, that's the whole point. Uh, so you, have, you need a way uh, to, to describe the connection between them. And one way that we have in hyper is for this function called grid set neighbor part. Uh, the code grid set neighbor part takes the grid object, of course, and then a part and a neighbor part. In this case, we're going to, on part three, make the connection to part two. So part is three, neighbor part is two. Um, and what we do is um, we describe this strip of elements in two in different numberings. One that comes from part three, if we extend it, and the second one, the native numbering of part two. Okay, yes? So the logical coordinate between part three and part two does not line up? The what? The logical coordinate that you define with part three and part two, they, they don't have to line up? Because they, they don't have to line up. We're going to specify the connection between them at the end, actually. But, but first, first uh, let's go by you know, the order of the arguments here. The first thing we do is we specify one strip in the direction from part three to part two where we want to make the connection of elements in the numbering of part three and part two. For part three, we go one lower here. So this strip here is from one zero to four zero. Okay? And that's what I lower and I upper up. In terms of part two, this is simply one, one, two, one, four. That's what neighbor I lower and neighbor I upper up. And your, to answer your question, you also need to specify how the coordinate systems in these two parts are related. In this case, if you remember, x grows this way, y grows this way. Here, x grows this way, y grows this way. So the x here corresponds to y, and that's what these two um, last arguments provide. They basically say um, direction 0 and 1, which is x and y, correspond to direction 1 and 0 in this case. And with what direction? Is it positive or negative? So um, 1, the, the fact that the, 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 the zeroth argument is 1 means, means that x is y. And the fact that this is 1 means with positive direction. So x equals y from part 2. And y equals minus x. So this is x with a negative sign, all right? So you specify if x corresponds to y, and then if it's in the same direction or in the opposite direction. That's why I have two arguments, all right? Just because you can't have min minus 0 here, right? All right, so, uh, so that's what you do. Uh, that's how you describe the connection to part 2. You also need, of course, to describe the connection to part 4. Uh, similar call. You just need to describe, in this case, uh, this strip of elements here. And when, when, once, when you're done, you call grid assemble as before. All right, let me see. Yeah, uh, the only restriction we have is that all the parts need to have the same set of variables um, and types, you know, because uh, it will be difficult to make connections between um, problem that has only cell-centered variables here and say x phase variables there. So we assume that the, the variables and the types are the same on each, which probably is going to be the case in your problem anyway. And what will happen um, for this assembly is, of course, you will have some unknowns that will be shared between the processors. Hyper will take care of making them unique and making sure that the value, uh, you know, the, the uh, the stencils are assembled. 
what also may happen is you may have an X phase variable here that's Y phase on the other processor. Hyper will automatically make the identification again for you. All right. Okay, now how do we describe these interesting stencils uh, that I showed? And I'm just going to focus on one of them. Uh, the thing is, um, you create the stencil the same way as before. It's going to be a nine, uh, you know, stencil that involves it's of size nine. But this time, when you set the stencil entry, you also specify uh, to each for, for which variable to, to which variable you're connecting. So, for example. Here, the connection to itself, it's going to be with logical offset 0, 0. And we, we're connecting to a, y to a y phase variable, so to itself. That's why variable type here is 2. And this is what uh, these triangles and different shapes here identify. Now, remember, it's 0, 0 because, um, as I said, the um, upper right uh, convention tells us that um, for this cell, uh, the, um, uh, the Y phase variable that corresponds to it is this one, and this corresponds to the lower cell. Okay. Now, the connection uh, to the Y phase variable on the bottom is with logical offset 0 minus 1. Um, and it's, again, a variable uh, of type 2, the Y phase variable. Okay. And you go on the same way, the connection to the top, another Y phase variable. The offset is 0, 1. The connection uh, to the cell-centered variable, these are the same uh, uh, logical offset 0, 0, uh, is specified next. And the only thing that changes here is that you say that it's connection to variable of type 0. 0 was cell-centered. This is the connection to the top. X phase, you have four of them. This guy is minus 1, 0. This is 0, 0. This is minus 1, 1. And this is 0, 1. And their variables, um, the index was 1. Okay. And that's it. Um, once you've done all this, you can actually create the graph and set these different stencils that you create a different, uh, that you just created a different variable. So the stencil um, uh, that, so you created, let's say, a cell, cell center stencil, you set it to variable 0, which were the cell centered variables. And the X tensile and the Y tensile that we just created, you will set it to the Y, um, uh, the y uh, edge, uh, the Y phase variables, which were, uh, which were variable two. And then you assemble the graph. All right. Uh, this guy described the semi-structured grids and stencils. Any questions about this? You assume what? Each page of the grid will belong to a different processor. Each page? Page. Patch. Oh, each patch? Uh, not, uh, not necessarily. One, uh, what we call parts. One processor can have multiple parts. You still have to describe the connections between them. OK. Um, OK, now let's talk about the matrices. They're done in the same way as in the struct case. Um, it's just S struct matrix set values and uh, add values. Um, can, yeah, OK. Um, box values, for example, uh, if, if you set boxes at a time. Um, now, this is kind of the classical way of how the S struct interface was used. But we, we, we've added. Uh, um, some changes uh, since this version of Hyper a few years ago. Um, so instead of um, set neighbor part that I just talked about, we have a more general function that grid sets shared part um, that allows you to specify more general connections between uh, parts. Uh, I'll give you an example of that in a second. And we also have these finite element functions. So FEM is for finite element method that allow you to specify a finite element problem uh, on the grid without referring to stencils. This is some of the example codes that uh, we have in Hyper that show this. Um, and hopefully, I'll have some time to, to, 
to go through some of them uh, real quick at the end. So he, let, let, let's look at this problem. We have uh, this star-shaped domain, and we're going to describe it with six parts. Each part will have a uniform um, grid with this um, uh, parallelogramic element. Um, this is the stiffness matrix that uh, corresponds to this numbering 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, it depends on the angle here. In this case, the angle is pi over 3, but depending on how many parts you have, it will depend on the parts. So this is just an example. We have, we have some ma stiffness matrix. Now, how do we use it to uh, define the problem? Okay. Uh, again, we're going to assume processors that own each, uh, six processors owning uh, the, these six parts. And let's focus on processor zero that owns part zero. Okay. Now, um, we define it the same way as before. Uh, we define a grid uh, of dimension two with six parts. It's on, it has only one box, let's say going from one one to nine nine. Let's say it only has one variable. So this will be nodal finite elements where the degrees of freedom are at the vertices. So we're gonna say variable node. Okay. And now we uh, what if we want to use finite element, what we need to do is for each for each element, for each cell, we need to describe what's the ordering of the unknowns. We do this from the logical center of the element, and we basically provide vectors that identify the directions in which the unknowns are. So, for example, for this numbering, 0, 1, 2, 3, these vectors are minus 1, minus 1 this way, 1, minus 1 this way, 1, 1 this way, and minus 1, 1 that way. That's what this call um, to set fem ordering does. It orders the unknowns. It has three components because that's general for 3D. Okay. Now we've, we're prepared to um, start calling uh, the finite element functions to set the local stiffness matrices. But in this problem, uh, we need to do something, uh, uh, something new, which is to establish a connection for nodal variables between two parts, or not just two, but many parts, that meet only at the vertex. So um, the node that's at the origin here belongs to all processors. So we need to have a connection not only between part 0 and part 1 and part 0 and part 5, which is what we showed before, but also between part 0 and part 2 and part 3 and part 4 because they share this node. Okay? This is where this more advanced function that I mentioned before, set shared part, um, as opposed to set neighbor part, uh, is used. And the way you um, use this function is by specifying essentially um, a strip of shared degrees of freedom, in this case, shared nodes. Again, in two different ways uh, from the perspective of part zero and part one. Okay? Here, here's how it goes. So um, I'm going to specify the nodes on this blue line here, the, the, the boundary between these two parts. Uh, that blue line corresponds to uh, a box with extends 1, 1 and 1, 9 on part 0 and extends 1, 9 and 9, 1 in part 1. Remember, x goes this way, y goes this way, x goes this way, y goes this way on part 1. Okay? So this is what we say, the part, the box from this side, the same box on the shared part on the other side. And now um, we have this offset that gives us, for this, box, for this box that we're describing, where are the unknowns that we want to synchronize? It's a logical direction. For part zero, the box on, on the left side, on the left boundary, that's why the offset is minus one zero. For part one, the unknowns on the bottom, so the offset is zero minus one. Those are the, these offsets that we provide. And then again, we have this index maps that relate the coordinate transformations between the two parts as before. <laughs> Okay. Um, the same way you describe the connection between part zero and part five. So far, you could have done that with the other function too. So it's just a slightly different way, slightly modified way of describing it. But why do we need it? Because there was no way before to describe the connection between part zero and part two. With this interface, you can do that. And here's the example. So I just have one box, this here, the, the, the cell at the origin, which is one, one, 
from 1, 1 to 1, 1 in both cases. And the unknown that I want to describe here is with offset minus 1, minus 1 at the corner. The same goes for the other, um, for the other part. And I, I make call to the same function to establish the connection between these two. And I need to make the call to establish also the connection with part 3 and part 4. Okay? And even though this is slightly complicated, um, imagine what it will uh, be necessary for you to make sure that this unknown is shared between the different processors. Somebody needs to own it. Somebody needs to um, you know, communicate its values to all the other processors. Hyper does this automatically for you. You just describe the you know, logical relation between the parts. Yeah, and uh, you just assemble the grid, and, um, and now, you have, uh, now, now you're ready to, uh, um, yeah, you create the graph object, and now you're ready to, um, uh, to use finite elements to describe the actual uh, stencil values, if you want, or the matrix values, if you want, or the stiffness matrix, the local stiffness matrices, if you prefer. So to do that, you say, I'm going to use finite elements, so graph set fem. You can specify sparsity if your stiff, local stiffness matrix is very sparse for some reason. Um, assemble, because we know already the connectivity. We can assemble it. And this is how you set the actual values. You basically um, say for matrix A on this part, um, in, this, in the cell with this index, this, my stiffness matrix, which was 4 by 4, so it's 16 values, is this. So you go cell by cell, and you set the stiffness matrix locally. It just describes the local connections between the degrees of freedom in that cell. Yes? So do you automatically, automatically add the condition from part 1 to part 2? Yes. So, the, uh, so this local stiffness matrices are going to be assembled on each part and between the processors. You don't have to think about this. You only have to think about what's natural for you, which is the local structure you have. On this cell, this stiffness matrix, you know how the unknowns are connected in general for the parts. But the actual implementation in parallel, how um, you know, things get added and communicated, it happens uh, under the hood. So yeah, so the most natural way for a user would be to assemble element by element, something else I know. And the way we do it, that it, so where the starting from this, this cell, then, then we should assemble the, the element by element to a certain part of your processor. Yes, you just assemble it element by element. All you have to do is for each cell to, to, to tell us what is the stiffness matrix. That's all. For each element. For each cell or element, yes. We call it cells here. Yes, element. That's right. Element. And for vectors, you just pass the load vector. Okay? Okay, you can, you can as I said, uh, use the extract interface to define... Um, Adaptive mesh refinement problems where you have a subset of the grid that's been refined. Um, each AMR level is actually a separate part. And I don't know if I have a lot of time, but basically uh, when you have to establish connection between coarse unknowns and fine unknowns, you use this um, uh, uh, graph, use the graph to, 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 to specify these non-stencil entries directly. And, uh, it's a uh, graph app entries call that, that you can use to uh, specify problems like that, too. Okay. Um, the extract interface supports different matrix formats. And basically, parCSR is the one that you want to use for algebraic multigrid. And there is also a struct structured storage that's more appropriate for um, uh, our structured solvers structured multigrid solvers that I'm going to talk to about in a second. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a solver for MR grids in Hyper. Um, that's probably one of the few libraries that have a solver like that, the fast adaptive composite grid solver. Um, all right. Yeah, I probably should uh, move quicker. Um, I talked about the struct and the extract interface. They're kind of uh, similar to each other. Now let's switch gears to something completely, uh, well, not completely, but somewhat different, the finite element interface. So this is, um, this is a general interface that designed for finite element discretizations on unstructured grids. Okay? So far, in some sense, we had either structure, fully structured or block-structured grid. Um, 
Unstructured grids can have arbitrary connections and uh, can have quads and hexes and uh, triangles and tetrahedral elements. And this is an in interface that's been developed in Sandia. This is um, an actual specification of which that we're following. Uh, it's a C++ interface, unless, unlike the rest of Hyper, which is C. Um, we have some prototype implementation in Hyper, but you can also connect to the Sandia implementation. And uh, we have a brief description of how to use it, and um, we have an example, but basically uh, we're just implementing this interface and supporting this interface to describe the problem. And under the hood, um, we're converting, uh, once we assemble the matrix, we convert, we convert it to the um, formats that we need uh, to call our solvers. Uh, the most general way to describe a problem is just to specify the matrix that you ultimately want to solve. And that's the IJ interface. Um, there's no grid, there's no stencil, you just specify a matrix and vector. If everything else fails, you can always call this. This somewhat limits the solvers that are available to you though. So it's a trade-off. Let's say this is the five-point stencil, um, uh, almost. Uh, I guess there might be some stuff missing. But let's say we want to specify, wow. Um, yeah, I guess, okay. Uh, let's say uh, we want to split this matrix in three processors. The way that's done in Hyper is each processor owns a contiguous um, range of rows. So let's say um, processor zero rows uh, owns the first four rows, then processor one, the next three rows, and so forth. And let's focus on processor one. How, how will we describe this matrix? on processor one, define an IJ matrix object, okay? And you say, um, I'm gonna own rows four to six. That's what I lower and I upper in this case means, it's just a range. In principle, you should specify the columns that you own to. Um, for symmetric matrices, those will be the same as the rows, but in principle, you may wanna define rectangular matrices for some reason, and then those may differ. So in this case, the range of low, uh, rows and columns that shown are the same from four to six. And IJ matrix create, based on this information, will return an uh, IJ matrix object. You say that it's gonna be a hyper parse SR matrix. This is our default format, parallel compressed parse row. You initialize the matrix, and then the call to actually fill the non-zero entries is uh, IJ matrix set values, okay? You can specify all these uh, entries at, in, with one function call. Uh, what, you what you do is say, how many rows are you gonna set at the same time? In this case, we're gonna set all three rows. So we say number of rows is three, okay? How many columns in each row? That should be an array of this size. So we have five entries here, four entries here, three entries here. So the number of columns in each row are four, five, four, and three re respectively. Which are the rows? Four, five, six. And which are now the columns? Those are consecutively um, all the columns uh, from these rows in, in order that you're setting. Okay, so columns are one, three, four, five, seven, and so forth, okay? 12 columns all in all when you sum those together. Okay, and finally, what are the values? And that's all. You, spe you, you put all this data in this function call. You can set values in any way you want, rows at a time, just partial at a time. You can add to values that you've already set. Uh, it's quite flexible and quite general. And then you assemble the matrix, and um, if you need to get a parse CSR matrix, you just call this, um, matrix get object. All right, that's, okay, that's, that's the um, IJ interface. Is that clear? Any questions? Yes? Do you support matrix free methods? No. And the reason for that is that, um, well, it depends what you mean by matrix free, to be more precise. In the structured case, we do support um, constant uh, coefficient stencils and solvers that do not assemble the matrix. For unstructured grid, no, and the reason is um, that our main solver there is algebraic multigrid, and algebraic multigrid uses the actual matrix entries to define this coarse 
uh, spaces in multigrid and the interpolation operator in multigrid in, in a very essential way. Any other questions? All right. Um, now, here are the four interfaces that I just talked about. Struct test, struct FEI, IJ. And here are some of the solvers that we have. The check marks mean this solver is available there. For example, um, AMG is available in all interfaces except for struct. Okay? Uh, if you just want to do precondition, if you just want to conjugate gradient to GMRS, that's always available. But uh, of course, you want to use those with some of these preconditioners. Okay, how do you define a new solvers? You call solver create with a communicator that gives you an abstract solver object. Then you set some of its parameters, like the convergence tolerance, um, number of iterations. And then you call solver setup with the solver, the matrix, the right hand side, and uh, what you're going to use for solution. And then you call solve. Uh, with the same arguments, basically these two functions are usually one after the other. Once you've computed the solution, you can extract the values that you're interested in with get values, and at the end you need to, of course, clean the memory and destroy the solver object. Okay, this is kind of uh, the general um, the general procedure. Here's a concrete example. This is with uh, this solver called SMG, and that's a structured solver. So this will be all these calls here struct SMG. You create it. What we said here is that we're going to do just one iteration, um, and the tolerance is zero, which means we're just going to use it as a preconditioner. We're just going to apply it once. Uh, we, don't, we don't try to converge with it. Um, that also means that it's going to be a preconditioner. And by the way, it's, the variable is defined to be a pre its named preconditioner. Uh, these two variables tell us how many smoothing steps we need to do in the V cycle, one on the way down, one on the way up. Then we create a preconditioned conjugate gradient solver. For that, we set a tolerance. So this will be the actual convergence tolerance that we are trying to uh, uh, solve to. And to put these things together, we make this call, um, PCG set precond. So for the PCG solver, we use this preconditioner, and these are the preconditioning functions that are used for the solve and the setup. And then we just call PCG setup and PCG solve, and uh, that, uh, that will solve uh, this problem and return the solution in that uh, struct vector x. <coughs> All right, so um, now I'm going to, so this is kind of the general structure. I'm gonna give you a little bit, uh, I'm gonna give you an example in, in a little bit. Um, but now what I'm gonna, what, what I would like to do is go for some of the solvers that are available in Hyper. And that's kind of the main thing that, uh, that will be useful for you besides the interfaces. Uh, so let me start with the structured solvers. Those are relevant in the struct and potentially the struct interfaces. Um, those are, uh, we have two of them, SMG and PFMG. SMG is the more robust one. It's using plane smoothings in 3D. Uh, PFMG uses uh, um, simpler smoothing. So as a result, PFMG is more e efficient, but SMG is more robust. It can solve problems that PFMG maybe can't. We have, as I mentioned, constant coefficient versions of those which are significantly more efficient. Um, FAC is the solver that I mentioned about uh, adaptive mesh refinement problems. Boomer AMG is uh, our algebraic multigrid solver that's available in all interfaces except for struct. It's uh, corresponding to matrix class par CSR. And that's really the solver you want to use for unstructured problems, uh, finite element problems, diffusion. Um, it's defining its multigrid components in a purely algebraic way based only on the matrix. Uh, and it has a lot of options uh, to influence how you define your core spaces and your interpolation. Um, there is really no information besides the matrix that it needs. So that's its appeal. You don't need to specify a hierarchy of refinement, uh, uh, of refined meshes or anything like that. You just give it the matrix and it solves it. And it works quite well and it's quite scalable here. This is, this is really old because it only says 10,000. We've scaled it to more than 150,000 processors. Okay. Uh, we have a solver for definite Maxwell problems, but Actually, the ones I want to 
focus on our, uh, uh, these two guys. So AMS is the auxiliary space Maxwell solver. It targets um, a definite, prob definite electromagnetic problems, so a curl curl problems, discretized with nanolac finite elements, if uh, you're familiar with those, or edge finite elements. Um, that actually is built on top of AMG, and uh, it's, again, uh, specific to this particular finite element discretization. Besides the matrix, that, uh, this solver requires a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit additional information uh, that is specific for the finite element discretization. But again, it's a solver that's quite scalable and works on uh, challenging problems with variable coefficients, large jumps, uh, and on many processors. We also have a similar solver, which is another auxiliary space solver that's targeting, so this is a curl-curl problem. Um, the auxiliary space divergence solver is targeting a grad diff problem. So if you have diff diff bilinear forms, say from mixed methods or so here alpha and beta are both real, right? Alpha and beta are real, yes. So hyper 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 does not support uh, currently complex arithmetic. It's all real. So if you have complex numbers, you need to um, look 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 at the equivalent real systems that you get and solve those with hyper. You can always, when you have a complex problem, you can always reduce it to. Well, it's uh, it's the same storage in some sense. You either store two doubles. So the storage in principle shouldn't double, right? Yeah, the story is the same, the size. Will the size will double, double, yes. But yes. The same precondition works, the same because then the structure of the matrix. So the it, de it depends on what pro So if your real problem looks like this, with positive, specifically with positive uh, uh, beta, then you can use this solver on the blocks. But if it's not, then you can't. Yes? Uh, I think one issue about using this equivalent real form is that uh, I, I'm not sure if you use a multi bit map, it, it wouldn't know to do the coarsening correctly. So you get a real and a complex card. Right. So when you do the equivalent real form, of course, you want to treat the block separately. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that you just apply it to the block matrix. Oh, I see. Okay. Of course. OK. Um, Paracels uh, is a, a form of approximate sparse inverse um, that's trying to define the preconditioner by minimizing the Frobenius norm of I minus A uh, M. And it has some graph theory behind it um, about what should be the sparse structure of M in this minimization. Um, Euclid is um, uh, uh, basically an incom incomplete LU. Uh, Factorization method that's um, you know good for very general problems. It's uh, probably not on the same level of scalability as uh, the AMG solver or the MS solver or the uh, uh, the structured multigrid solvers. But um, for small to maybe medium sized uh, problems, it's the most general thing we have. It will always solve solve it uh, solve the problem that you give it. All right. Um, if you want to use Hyper, you need to download it. This is the web page again. Uh, we have user and reference manual that um, uh, describe basically give a, uh, uh, in the user manual, you get tutorials similar to this talk, and the reference manual just describes it, each function and its arguments. Um, there is a short form that needs to be filled there. It's just so we keep track of uh, you know, how many people are using our software. You build it uh, simply by doing configure and make. Um, we have various options, debug options, OpenMP if uh, you want to use threads. Um, so on this Mac machine, for example, I don't have Fortran. So disable Fortran is useful. Um, now, if you want to use Fortran, of course, you don't want to configure it this way. Um, and we have a directory of example programs that are simple. Um, that uh, accomplish simple tasks with the different interfaces and the different solvers, that might be um, a good starting point for you. And I think I have the time to maybe go for some of them. Um, so far, I've mostly talked about C.
But you can also call high perform Fortran. Uh, we have Fortran versions of pretty much all our routines. This is what matrix set value, for example, looks in Fortran. It's pretty much the same thing. You just use different variables. And instead of this abstract class, you essentially have something that uh, describes this is a, under the hood, this is just a void pointer. Um, this, is, this is one way to use it from Fortran. We also support uh, a very general tool that's developed at Livermore called Babel. And Babel allows you to connect to many different languages, um, uh, Java and Python and Fortran 90. Um, that comes um, as a separate um, or as different uh, download. Uh, when you download Hyper, you can pick either to download just uh, Hyper without Babel or with Babel, and the reason that we split that is the Babel is quite big, so it doubles the size of the download. Um, but but the nice thing about it is that it kind of uh, it's more object oriented. Uh, it allows us actually to infuse object oriented um, um, uh, concepts in Hyper. That's purely C code, uh, and it, if if you if you look for example at the way how we define the matrix and specify that it's a parse CSR format. Uh, the, hi the Babel Hyper interface just has this B in front of it. It's also quite similar, okay? And just to give you an idea, this is kind of some of the, um, the class structure that relates the operator, the vector, the solvers, the preconditioners, uh, and the different conceptual interfaces uh, that are used in, um, in, in our Babel implementation. Okay? If you have questions or you want to report bugs, you just send an email to Hyper Support. First time you do that, it will come back to you and uh, um, tell you that you need to resubmit your email with specific code. This is just uh, our challenge response system to um, avoid spam. Uh, from that point on, you'll just send emails and that will automatically create issue in our um, roundup uh, issue tracker and uh, the whole Hyper team will see your email and respond. Okay, so that's uh, the end of my talk. Um, and now what I want to do is I want to give you a very short demo of, um, right, of, 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 of uh, some of the examples in Hyper, right? So, uh, okay, here I am in the, in the Hyper directory. Oh, I don't know why. Let's make it this way. So um, we have first, uh, when you download it, you have a, a docs directory where the reference um, and user manual are. So for, this is the um, user manual. It goes, as I said, I don't know if you can see very well, um, but it goes, for example, it, uh, for the different available interfaces. It goes for ex this exact example that I just talked about. So a lot of the... You, you will recognize a lot of these things from the talk. Um, it, uh, it talks about maybe in a little bit more details about the solvers and the preconditioners um, and also the Babel-based interface. We also have the reference manual, which is uh, really just the programming manual. For example, if you are interested in the bar CSR solver and specifically um, in AMG, you go and you look at um, the uh, AMG functions. Let's say this is um, um, AMG setup here. So AMG setup, I don't know if you can see it. It says what are the parameters, what is input, what is output, uh, and a short description of the function. So we have this for all the functions in the library. Okay. Now, um, the source is in the source directory. And what I want to show you uh, specifically is the other examples, okay? Uh, okay, we have many examples. Uh, the best way for you to look at them is to open the readme.html file in that directory, okay? And what this, um, what this file is, is it's, uh, it gives you different uh, uh, grouping of the examples depending on what you're interested in. You can look at them by the different interface they use by the type of equation that they're solving, by the type of the discretization that they're solving, uh, that they're using, 5.9 point finite elements, which solver they're using, 
in what language, or you can just look at all the example codes one by one. So, for example, if you're looking at finite element, you, you want to use finite elements, you see that there are four examples that you can look at, and then you can click on the, every single one of them. Um, so maybe let me, let me see if I can show you some of them. Um, let's say example two is the two processor example that I started with in the beginning. The s -truct example where you had two boxes and two processors. Uh, and let me just um, briefly go over the code. Um, so, okay. Here's where you, crea you create and set up the grid. Now, we focused before only on processor zero. This is uh, specified by my ID here. But you also have to make the call, as I said, on processor one. Processor one, if you remember, had only one box. Maybe if you look at the beginning of the slides, you will see that. Um, grids, this, 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 is the, this is setting the extents of the grid. Then you assemble it. Uh, then you define the stencil. It was the five-point stencil, if you remember, with these uh, offsets. You define the extract matrix. And um, in this case, uh, uh, we, yeah, here we set the, the matrix coefficients, which are, um, we set all five of them in this case, not like in the example, only two. Um, this was in the first box. This is in the second box. Um, this is on processor one, on the neighbor. This is where we impose the boundary conditions, where we set to zero the things that stick out, the stencil entries that stick out of the, um, and that's, you know, you need to go for several boxes to do that. Okay. Um, okay. And then you assemble the matrix. Okay. The right, the right hand side and your initial guess are much simpler. Um, for the right hand side, you just put uh, ones. For uh, the initial guess, you just put zeros. Uh, this is on box one, box two, processor one. So it's kind of automatic. And then this is the actual uh, solver call here. You, you said create a PCG solver solver. And I'm going to solve to 10 to the minus 6 uh, at most 50 iterations. This is the solver I'm going to use, which is this SMG, the Structured Multigrid Preconditioner. Um, and this is some of the parameters that I previously uh, uh, listed on the slides. PCG set precont tells this PCG solver to use this preconditioner, and this is just set up and solve. And then I free the memory. And that's it, 400 lines. Um, now, um, it says that we can just run it like that. This is what happens, free iterations. Just solve it. Okay, the next example I'd like to show you. Um, I have a question. Yes. What parts create blocking? So, I mean, normally when you write an MPI code, at some point you have to do some sort of barrier so that everything sets up and you make sure that everything is written everywhere. And is that no there is no, you, you don't need to do any explicit uh, barriers here. As, as you see, you don't need to do any yeah, explicit communications. Clearly, it needs to have the matrix assembled before it can solve it. Right. And it needs to solve it before you are able to use the solution. But that happens internally and actually without any barriers. It's just at the end of the function, all processes okay. need to reach it at th that time. So you don't need to worry about any communications, okay. actually. OK, uh, let me, um, yeah, let me, s uh, this is a more general, uh, this example is a more general, um, um, solves a more general equation with the, with the struct interface. So you have, you know, reaction, um, convection, diffusion equation. And I'm just going to show you um, how it runs. So this will be on 16 processors on 16 simulated processors. Of course, I'm running on this laptop here. Um, and each processor has a 33 by 33, I believe, um, grid size. Uh, 
Uh, the reason I want to run this is to show you uh, something else that we've added recently, which is visualization of uh, the computations from the examples. Um, so under the examples directory, there is a vis directory here. And I'll just open the readme file in this directory. All right. Okay. Uh, so we are using this tool called GLVis. It's, it's another. It's a visualization tool that we've developed in a different project um, to visualize the examples. And this is, for example, uh, I just run this. Uh, that was example four. Anytime you run an example, it creates it outputs with 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 this option minus vis at the end. It saves the data from the run, and you can call GLVis to look at the solution. So in this case, this was a reaction diffusion problem with certain parameters on, on uh, the uniform grid. Uh, you can just call the, the corresponding script, which is in this case, for example, four. And, uh, and here's the solution that we computed. So we just did that. This is the grid, actually, it's, um, oops. It's so it's so big that you can't. Uh, <laughs> it's too big. It's it's black. Okay, so this is the problem that we just solved, right, on sixteen processors. Now let's go back. Oops. All right. Um, now this was this was both structured. Let me show an IJ example. This is example five. Uh, it's exactly the thing that I was showing you about the five-point stencil with IJ interface, okay? Um, let me just go quickly through the code. Um, basically, define this IJ matrix, but you also need this parse CSR object at the end for the solver. Um, this is just uh, common line arguments so far. You need to define what's your local size, so you need to kind of know how many uh, rows and columns um, you own, and you know you need to divide, but take into account that maybe things don't divide exactly. Um, IJ matrix create, set object type parse CSR, initialize, and then you call these functions set values to just give the non-zeros. Assemble. Um, we're gonna use this parse CSR object for the right-hand side. The initial guess it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just set values. Okay. And we're going to, again, take the par CSR versions, or par versions in this case. And this is how you now define the algebraic multigrid solver. You say, um, this is going to actually be a solver, not a preconditioner. You can use the hyper objects in both, uh, um, both ways. You just create Boomerang MG solver. You set a bunch of parameters. I told you it has a lot. Um, what course and type, this means how you're defining the course problems. What's relaxation type? How are you smoothing on each level? How many times you relax? How many maximal course levels you're allowed to uh, build? What's the tolerance? But once you do that, you, you can just go uh, and call uh, MG setup and solve. As I said, you can use this as a preconditioner. If you define the PCG preconditioner and use the set precon call, it would have been a preconditioner. But you can also use MG as a solver. Uh, and then once you're done, you get the number of iteration final residual destroyed. This is the example with PCG. So we have multiple solvers in this example. This is if you only do pre uh, PCG without preconditioning. And this is if, so there is no set precon. And this is when you combine them, PCG with preconditioner. All right? Uh, PCG with Paracels preconditioner. Um, that's what I meant when I said that the examples might be a good starting point for you. You can take the parts that you're interested. Uh, uh, they're relatively short. This is flexible GMRS with AMG. You know, this is, um, yeah, okay. And this is where you save the solution uh, for the visualization. But at the end of the day, um, it's, the main code is, you know, 500 lines. This, you just need this for the flexible gem rest where you change the preconditioner. Um, so let me, let me show you. Yes. You don't need to destroy it as long as you really can use the same preconditioner. In time-dependent problem, your matrix changes. If it changes slightly, that's OK, usually. But if it changes dramatically, you probably need to destroy the preconditioner and rebuild it. Okay. Well, let me show you um, 
yeah, so. Uh, okay, let's let's run this. Um, and this this, as I said, um, we're solving a five point tensor, so we just get. Uh, and this is just for the interior degrees of freedom, so you know we get the classical uh, hum function here. Okay. Um, Okay, um, the next one I want to show, um, we have the FEI, uh, the finite element interface example, and I'm not going to go into this detail. I'm just going to say it's example 10. If that's what you're interested in, um, the FEI functions are relatively different. They, they are done from an uh, uh, FEI object where you um, initialize blocks, specify uh, elements, and the connection between them, and so forth. But also, at the end, is not, um, um, you know, it's, it's not a horribly long or difficult to understand example. Just a lot of things uh, happen one after the other. If you are familiar with the, if you want to use the FEI interface, you'll have to familiarize yourself with that anyway. So. Um, uh, we have examples of eigensolvers. Um, I think um, the thing I want to show you is example 14, which is this um, this example from the talk. Um, it's more general in the sense that you can run it on any number of processors, and it will just uh, uh, this is on six processors, but you can run it on uh, as many as you want. Um, and this this uh, example actually has two versions. 13 and 14. In 13, we use tensors. In 14, we use the finite element functions. Other than that, the two examples are identical. So that might be useful for you if you're considering uh, moving from stencils uh, to, uh, to the finite element uh, stiffness matrices. So I'm just going to go for the stiffness matrix example here. Um, the first thing you, we have is a function that just tells us what the stiffness matrix is. And, um, um, that's based on the angle and the mesh size and stuff like that. Um, let's see. These are just uh, input parameters. Is the est is the extract interface? Uh, so you're describing um, the the grid and uh, the fem ordering as uh, I had in the talk. Um, then you make these calls to set shared part. Um, and those are the, your two, um, the first two are to your neighbor on the left and on the right. This again is in the case of as many processors as you want. And then the rest of them are to all the other processors, um, which are, uh, this is just one point that you're sharing. Okay, you set up the graph, create the matrix, uh, and you, um, Call these add fem values to the matrix on the right hand side, uh, basically looping over all the zones, all the elements. On, in each case, you get the stiffness matrix and you set it. That's all. Okay. Um, hmm. The vector is simple. Um, you get the parse CSR versions of the matrix, the right hand side, and the vector. Define an AMG solver and um, just solve with AMG, actually. No, no preconditioning. And this case just for visualization. Let me let me show you how this works. Um oops. All right. It took five cycles, five AMG cycles to solve that. It solved it really quickly. Um And this is what the solution actually looks like. Um, so it's a, this is the actual mesh that we just computed on. And hyper automatically, um, these are the six, um, let's see if I can do that, yeah. These are the six um, processors that we solved on. Hyper automatically matched everything together for you. And, um, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, F11 doesn't quite work very well on this. Uh, and, and, and made it continuous, obviously. And uh, 
assemble it into a global problem and solve it quite quickly. Let, just, just for the heck of it, let's run it on 36 processors instead of six. That took a little bit more iterations, but it would be significantly faster if you use it as a preconditioner, actually. Still, uh, um, you know, this is what, yeah, so this is actually not like that, but, but this is how many, this is a much larger problem, right? So this is how many unknowns we have. Plus, this problem is much more difficult because you get elements that have really bad aspect ratios. So that's, that's why we need more iterations. Okay. Um, I have two more examples that I want to cover real quick. Um, example 15, it's, uh, uh, th this is related to the AMS solver that I was talking about for definite Maxwell problems. So this is a 3D electromagnetic example where you're solving on, um, on the unit cube with nanolic elements, okay? And, um, you know, it define stiffness matrices, you define the auxiliary structures that you need for uh, this auxiliary space Maxwell solver. If you're interested, you have to look into it. But just in a, as an example, to see how quickly we solve things like that, this is eight processors. Um, so 10 by 10 on each processor, I believe. And it goes quite fast. And what we compute, of course, in this case, um, is um, a vector field. So um, this, uh, these are the eight processors. Sorry. These are the eight processors um, that we just used. Uh, what, we, what is plotted here is the magnitude of the field. Um, this is the actual field. Yeah, that's the electric field, yeah. Uh, if you can see anything here, yeah. But this is the actual vector field we just computed. Okay. GLVIS. is GLVIS is the software that I mentioned that's in the that comes <coughs> with the examples now. It's in the um, if you go into examples directory subdirectory vis, that's uh, um, uh, there's a description of it, and it, you need to download it and build it separately, but. Um, once you do that, each example, for each example, we have these scripts that every time you run the example with a minus this option, you can just call the script. And if you have JLVs installed and in your path, it will automatically do the same thing that I just showed you. And is it the format you are displaying? Is HDMI or what type of data format? Hyper just saves the raw um, numbers oh. from the, um, yes, yes, from each run. Uh, and GLVIS also creates a mesh object and a finite element space. And that's actually what I just want to show you now. The last example we have is um, example 16, and that's an extract solver where you have a high order finite element, a Q3 element. So um, Q3 has a, a, a four by four, um, so 16 degrees of freedom uh, per quad in 2D, okay? Um, and we solve a plus, and this is an example of a case where we can have multiple degrees of free, multiple unknowns of the same type in hyper. Obviously, if it's four by four, you have four interior degrees of freedom, which are associated with the cell. And in the struct interface, you cannot do that, but in the extract interface, this is supported. This is an example of how you can use hyper in this way. So these are the unknowns here, and the stiffness matrix, and um, um, you know, if that's what you're interested in, uh, I recommend that you start with this example. Um, this is how quickly we can solve something like that. This is on four processors. Again, this was just AMG as a solver. It's not even a preconditioner. Um, and now, going back to your question, um, our visualization software, GLVIS, knows, can know about finite elements. And in this case, it recognizes the fact that this is a cubic finite element. And and what it will do is it will plot the actual cubic functions as opposed to um, no, just, just first, these are the four processors that we used to solve it. Um, maybe, maybe to emphasize this point, it's better to run it like this. So a very small problem. So we, I just solved it on a four by four grid. Um, this is what GLVIS plots. But of course, um, 
you can see that this function is curved here, right? If you, um, I mean, maybe with more traditional software, um, uh, what you will get is something like this. But Jovis knows that this is a finite element, and it knows that it's a Q-free finite element, and it shows it to you like this. And that goes not just for this, but for nether like elements and other type of elements and so forth. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's the last example I wanted uh, to show you. Basically, I would highly um, recommend that once you kind of figure out what you want to solve and identify the interface you're interested in, um, to go to the example codes, maybe click on the interface or the solver that you're interested in, browse for some of the examples. Then increasing um, order of generality and difficulty. And hopefully, uh, starting from some of, one of them will be uh, an easy transition uh, to whatever you want to accomplish. Okay? Okay, so let's thank Are there additional questions? Yes. So you mentioned uh, that you can configure Hyper with an OpenMP flag for threading. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually just looking through the user's manual and reference manual and mm -hmm. found not a lot of information on that. What's the best way to see what's supported and what's not and how the that would be used differently? Um, it, OpenMP is supported with, uh, in, in pretty much all of our solvers, especially in okay. you know, the algebraic multigrid solver. Um, What's not maybe um, completely threaded right now is the setup phase of the MG solver, but the soft phase is, the soft phase is quite well threaded. And um, we have, maybe the user's manual is not the best place, but we have papers on our website that uh, talk about all, you know, results with OpenMP, and they're non-trivial. So um, if I'm already using another framework like Trilinos or Petsy, can I use Hyper as a preconditioner? It's uh, available for Petsy. But it's limited, no? It's not open. Um, there might be obviously an additional step for us to, to support it there, too. So it might not, not everything may be available, yeah. Right. Anybody else? Okay, so let's just thank, right. thank you again. Thanks.